Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I want to welcome you all and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, all right? It's today. And you know, uh, it's encouraging to me with St. Patrick's Day um, comes the realization, at least for me, that spring is a couple of days away. And uh, you know, it's been a long winter. It's been a long winter. There's been so many people that have been struggling with different illnesses, the flu, COVID, RSV, you know, the coughing thing that's been going around and so on. And, and you know, if you're like me, and I'll admit it, it's easy to feel defeated. It's easy to feel disillusioned. And uh, if you're like me, you want to just give up, right? I'm just so tired of coughing and blowing my nose. But uh, we can't do that, can we? Right? We can't just give in. And uh, instead, when you're down and ready to throw in the towel, so to speak, I want you to, to meditate on three different, I have three passages that we're going to look at today. And I want you to drop these in the back of your Bible, because these are places to go. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling out, that sort of thing, these are, are some places that I want you to go with. The first is in Psalm. It's Psalm 91, verses 1 to 6. And it says this, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous, pe perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. We can go to his shelter. And that's a reference to a hen, a mother hen, who brings all of her chicks under her wings to protect them. That's what a pic the picture is of what our Heavenly Father does for us. The next place I want you to look is Psalm 73, 26. It says this, it says, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then finally in Isaiah 41.10, he says this, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, God has not promised to remove the difficulties in our lives. In fact, as Christians, we have to know that we're in the middle of a spiritual battle, and it's not going to be easy Satan wants nothing more than to cause us to despair and to give up. But we can't do that. We have a heavenly father, a loving heavenly father who has promised to shelter us, to care for us, and to give us strength, especially in those times of difficulty. So the next time that you're down in the dumps on a rainy day like today, <laughs> and you're fed up with it all, think about those passages. Turn to the back of your Bible where you just jotted those down. And recognize that God's got you. He has got you. He really does. With that, let's stand and sing together. Good morning, everyone. These songs kind of go with that opening. So let them encourage you today and sing them loud.
you still do amazing things, that you've never changed. I pray that we will always rely on you, always find our strength in you, Lord, and thank you that we can praise you through Jesus' name. Amen. I have a long list of announcements, and I'm going to try to get through them quickly today, but um, First of all, we've been mentioning it for quite a while, is Talent Night, and that is coming right up. That is next Saturday, so sharpen your talents up. If you haven't put your name on the sign-up sheet out there with your talent, better do so quickly. You're going to miss your opportunity. We want to have more people to make fun, I mean, uh, uh, have fun with. <laughs> we don't heckle too much, only a little bit. But we're looking forward to that. That's going to be next Saturday at 6 p.m., and uh, we really have a good time. Come on out. Even if you haven't signed your name up on the town, we want you to be here as a spectator and have fun with us, and uh, we do have a good time with that. And uh, uh, after that, March 26th at 6 p.m. is a ladies' Bible study that's going to begin, and it's going to be every other week that's going to be happening. Sharon's right here. I knew you were up here front. Do you want to add anything to that? <coughs> Make sure you bring your Bible and a journal. You heard it. All right. So that's the ladies' Bible today, March 26th. Uh, Good Friday service, March 29th. Um, that's coming right up. It's right around the corner. And we're looking forward to that. We're going to be hosting the Good Friday service here. We've been going. We get together with a number of churches. If you're not familiar with what we've done, we've been going to other churches. We've gone to a number of other churches to get together on Good Friday. This year, it's going to be here. Pastor Russ, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, i got a couple of things I wanted to mention, and the other churches are mentioning the same thing. Uh, each, um, each Friday service, we have an offering for something outside of all of our churches, and we try to pick something that, uh, and this year, is a family in Turner, uh, Alyssa Cole, a 10-year-old uh, little girl in, uh, in that school where my wife works, and, and she passed recently of brain cancer. And her family uh, is, is the ones we're going to support. So uh, we'll have that right at the beginning of the service. So just be thinking about that before we get here uh, so that you're ready for that, that special offering to really bless that family. Uh, the other thing is, because our church is the smallest of the three churches, uh, <laughs> we're hoping to have this place completely packed. In fact, we're going to have an overflow downstairs. And I want you to pray about this. You know, we're going to have a lot of guests here. Uh, so if we end up in that kind of a situation, be praying that maybe some of us will make our way downstairs and give our guests the best seats uh, so they can enjoy the service as well. So those are two things I wanted to mention. Looking forward to that service. Really, it's always a special service. It's going to be a little different this year, so it's uh, something we're looking forward to. Uh, with that, that's Easter weekend, so we are uh, right into our Easter services. We are planning on having our Easter sunrise service, as we typically do at Martin's Point. We watch the sun come up, and we sing some, ki uh, some songs. Uh, not carols. It's not Christmas yet. <laughs> we sing some songs and have a little uh, devotional there as the sun comes up over the hill. And, of course, that's... Uh, Provided it doesn't rain. We did get rained out a couple of years ago here. But after that, we're going to have our Easter sunrise breakfast. And uh, we're getting ready for that. Peter, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, I was supposed to bring a sign-up sheet today with a donation list for food, and I forgot it. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll share that on the prayer thing. This yep. Week, and then I'll, I'll have another one here for next weekend. Uh, I'm not going to be here Sunday, but I'll make sure that the sign-up sheet and it, it, during the week, if you want to respond, I'll bring this or that. I'll jot it down on a list, so when I drop the list off on Friday, it'll be up to date. Uh, I'm going to need four or five people to help out. Uh, Saturday, I need some help from 10 to 12 to set up and prep some food downstairs. We do a little bit ahead of time. I think Sunday morning be here. And then I need four or five people here Sunday morning. Uh, I get here at 5, and uh, we, have, we have the breakfast ready by 6.30. And, and trust me, there's plenty of bacon, so <laughs> it's a motivator, right? Pastor can't wait for that I'm, he's already here. He's got a bed set up downstairs, so he's like the first guy here. Yeah. He heard bacon, and he's like, that's it. I'm there. All right. And with that, we have our, Easter, our regular Easter service. And again, it's going to be a little different this year, and we're looking forward to it, something uh, just a little bit special. And uh, 
for ser Easter service is always special. So we encourage you to invite your friends and come join us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, on the April 6th, we're going to have a men's work day here. We haven't had a men men's Bible study in a little bit, and so this is an opportunity for us as men to get together. We're going to work on some projects and uh, just get some things done around here, but really it's more about just being together as guys and spending some time together. It's going to kick off at about 8 a.m. on April 6th. you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, starting next week, I'm going to bring the list in with me, and I'm going to try to prioritize, but if you've got a special skill finished carpenter or well, carpenter or anything in between Not or none of the above, just let me know and you can probably, uh, I don't want to say pick and choose from the list, but whatever you match is up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you have something that you're good at, let him know and we'll match you up with the right project. Plenty of projects to do. I'm good at taking out trash. All right, uh, April 19th to the 20th uh, is the ladies' retreat, and uh, we're looking forward to that. You want to add anything to that, Tracy? Um, all I want to say is just make sure that you find a passage or pick your passage or Bible verse that really speaks to you. We're going to be discussing that on Saturday. Friday will be a time of dinner and fellowship and just kind of getting to know each other a little bit deeper. And then Saturday will be, we'll be discussing um, God's Word. Awesome. So bring your favorite passage, something that speaks to you, and uh, that'll be part of the topic of discussion on Saturday. So, Also looking forward to a paint night here, April 27th at 5 p.m., and uh, we have someone coming in that's going to be instructing us in painting. Do you want to add anything to, anything to that, Tricia? Uh, not really. Okay. It's going to be 5 p.m. It's $20, and the list is almost full. So if it's something that you're interested, get your name on the list because it's going quickly. All right. Also mentioning um, there is an Easter egg hunt for the little ones. It's going to be happening over at Sunco on the Saturday before Easter uh, at 10 a.m. There's going to be face painting and games, and uh, sounds like a good time. I might try to put on my kitty suit and uh, sneak in. I think that's all I had for announcements this morning. What did I miss? Michelle. Right. I'm trying new technology today, so bear with me as I try to find where I hid my <coughs> praise and prayer list here. There it is. How about praise and... Oh, you know what? Before we move on to praise and prayer, I have a praise this morning. It's for the Seder dinner, and we have a little video that goes along with that. So with that, roll that video. <laughs> At this time, in the traditional state of Roma, there would be a celebration of the Lord. We have a lot of the It was in a mall. I think we might have put it. Do you want to pass it to Try it. If you like it, you like it. Let me know. I'll give you a We will now drink the cup of redemption and eat the offered home. That was something new for us this year, and uh, I think it's something we probably ought to make a tradition. And uh, that was really cool. Thank you for those that put that on, put that together for us. All right, praise and prayer requests today. Ron. Uh, praise. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. It's uh, really helpful because I need it. <laughs> but I'm back, so that it, it, it could be praise or prayer. Yeah, it's a praise for you, a prayer for us. <laughs> We're glad that you're here. That has been a long time. Yeah. So, up I, here. so I can see that while I'm gone, good things are happening. Yes, <laughs> it's true. I'm so sure about that. We planned it that way. <laughs> Thank you all. Glad you're here, Ron. Good to see you back. Other praise and prayer requests this morning. Tracy. I just have a 
kind of crazy. I'm glad Holly's back. She, we've missed her the last few weeks. Uh, she's been playing basketball, but it's really yeah. good to have her back in charge. There she is. I'm looking for her. <laughs> and leading us in worship this morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Russ? Yeah, well, obviously, you mentioned lots and lots of sickness going around, um, and the joy is, has got it at this point. So she's at home watching. Is she praying that she feels better? It has been an unbelievable sick season this year. It really has. And uh, boy, this the. The thing that just keeps hanging on and hanging on, and whatever it is, I'm ready for it to be gone. It needs to go. We need some sun, some warm, get rid of it. See your hand back here. I have a son that in the Philippines. I've been working over two years to get here uh, legally uh, as an immigrant. We're very, very close. Uh, the number's going to be up hopefully in this week or next week. We received a letter. Any prayers you can give us would be. Absolutely. We will pray that he gets good news and can come here. All right. I saw a hand over here somewhere. Lynn? Yeah, as many know, I've been through a lot in the past few years, and I just have to thank the Lord for all that he is with me all the time, and I'm, I'm so thankful. Amen. Amen. He's got you. Even in the difficult times, especially through the difficult times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He is with me. It's a great praise. This is to back up what you said. Uh, when I went through my toughest times uh, with loss, I've always felt the Lord closer to me than when at any other time. I'd always, always lift him. But when I could stand there and pray and I could literally feel his arms around me, it got me through. And it, it isn't always just that. When we go through our toughest times, we feel him the closest. That's true. Remember that. Tammy? Um, yeah, I just want to comment on last night's <coughs> spaghetti dinner. Um, everybody got put it on. was a good time and uh, it was a lot of fun a lot of food and uh, great time of getting together and having some new faces in here and uh, yeah it was really good Dixie um, I'm going on vacation this week so I like traveling mostly okay someplace sunny and warm <laughs> I wish I hadn't asked <laughs> all right Well, I hope you have a wonderful vacation, and hopefully, the, I don't know if the weather's ever bad in Hawaii, but uh, we'll pray for traveling mercies for you. Yeah, and that you come back, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mark? Oh, yeah, I'd like to uh, pray for uh, Tim Gwinnett and his uh, husband. Affected by the volcano eruption yesterday in Iceland. Really? They had to evacuate a town. All right. Definitely hold them up in prayer. Tracy? Um, I will take prayer from everybody. Over the course of the last six months, I think everybody knows I've lost two sisters. I've had total knee replacements. You're having emergency surgery. And it's kind of all kind of all of a sudden not building up on me. I'm struggling right now big time. And everything's kind of on edge a lot. 
so um, I, we met Friday morning and I talked to the ladies about it, but I would take some prayer because I, it, this is, all of a sudden it's really hard. I'm really having a hard time. All right, we'll definitely hold you up in prayer and uh, you have gone through a lot and we will definitely uh, look out for you. Jim? I want to pray for a friend of, our, a friend of mine, Joel Lavelle. He went through prostate uh, surgery this week and uh, he's recovering from that, but he had to have radiation for another five weeks after that. Pray for the country of Haiti, the turmoil that's going on there. And uh, I like to pray for our service members that we go uh, overseas. Yep. So we will pray for Joe, Haiti, and service members overseas. Here. Um, I think most of you know that our daughter Katie is expecting, and um, the baby looks well, uh, but there might be some complications and problems. So she's having further ultrasounds this week and further testing. So um, just be praying for them and and for us. <laughs> Whole family. It's nerve wracking for sure. So we will definitely hold your family up. See all kinds of hands. Shirley? I'd like to have pray some prayers for our first responders without whom I don't know what would happen. Definitely. In harm's way every single day and uh, taking care of us even uh, at their own risk. facing surgery this week. I would like to ask a prayer for Johanna. We've been praying for her for the cancer. She had surgery two or three weeks ago, and she got a notice from the doctor on Wednesday that it failed. Okay. A lot of damage that they needed to repair that they weren't aware of. Whether she'll be able to jump again or not. She said it's okay because she's there for the medical. That's her priority. Yeah. So right. she'll be on crutches for two months. Oh. And <coughs> she and Ron can race. <laughs> she and Ron can race. <laughs> Unfair competition. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> There's always a way. <coughs> All right. Also, pray for Adam because he's under a heavy burden now with first Johanna and now Ari. So, and the church. So, yeah. He's got a lot on his plate. A lot going on there. So, we'll definitely we'll hold Johanna up in prayer and uh, we'll pray that the doctors. You know, have wisdom, know what to do, how to move forward, and uh, that should be good news. We'll pray for Ari and her hip injury, and we will pray for Adam as he's dealing with all of that. So, Other praise or prayer requests this morning? Cheryl. Oh, perfect. So everybody can enjoy it all. <laughs> she was calling when I woke up this morning. I said, where's Paige? When my husband said, oh, she's gone to Cherryfield. 
Oh, yes. Spread it around. Everybody <laughs> wants it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. All right. We will hold Paige up in prayer as well. Trisha? Our prayers for my friends, Tina and Rick, as they're traveling and going on vacation. Yeah. And, and we're stuck with Kimmy because yes. of it. Yes. <laughs> we're glad you're here, Kimmy. All right. Tina and Rick are traveling on vacation in warm climates. Yep, it's hard to uh, it's hard to feel bad for them, really. <laughs> Any other praise or prayer requests this morning? Oh, more hands. Uh, one to my mother. She's been struggling with dizziness and the problems with her eyes. But then a praise too, because we were in the ER last night and they did a CAT scan and nothing dangerous shows up. So. Okay, good, good. So that's good news, but uh, still uh, something to deal with there anyway. Okay. So another hand over to Michelle. We need to step up and be heard, definitely. We have a voice here, and uh, we need to exercise our rights to uh, put down some of these really negative bills that are coming up in our state um, yes. Senate, Congress. Any other prayer requests before we take this? All right. I'm going to take these to the Lord in prayer, and as we do, if our ushers would come forward to take our morning offering. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you today. We thank you for um, this church family that we have here. We thank you that uh, Ron is able to be back with us. It's a praise. He's been gone for a long time uh, dealing with his injuries, and uh, we're just thankful that he's able to be here with us um, and so many others as well. And uh, we're just thankful that you are a God who loves to take care of us. You love to hold us in the palm of your hand, cover us with your wing, protect us and shelter us. And uh, Father, even though we know that difficulties are going to come up, things are going to come into our lives that are, are real struggles, but Father, you have promised to help us through them, give us strength in them, and uh, to grow us by them. And uh, help us to have that perspective because it's aw awfully easy for us to just get irritated, uh, throw our hands up, and uh, sort of give up on it all. But uh, we know that you will... You will make it all turn out for good, and uh, that's what we want, and uh, help us to recognize that, to see it with your eyes, and Father, we're, we're thankful for uh, the spaghetti dinner that went so well last night, and uh, we're just thankful for those that you brought through our doors, and I uh, pray for each one, and uh, touch their hearts. And Father, we have so many um, that we're praying for that are sick, and uh, dealing with different injuries or illnesses, and you know each one, and I just pray that... Uh, you will give them the strength and the comfort they, that they need to face each day. And uh, Father, so many that um, are living in turmoil, we think of Haiti and other places throughout the world uh, with the volcano uh, eruption and all of these things that are, that are coming up and uh, just causing so much distress in our world. And Father, I just pray for each one, each situation, and, and there's so many that we don't even know about. We know that there's persecution worldwide because people claim your name. So Father, we pray for strength for each one. Father, we think of uh, uh, so many that are, are traveling, and uh, whether it's for vacation or work or whatever, uh, I just pray for traveling mercies. The weather can be uh, difficult this time of year, and uh, you know, planes can get uh, delayed and so on. I just pray for each one that is traveling, that you'll give them the, the, uh, the strength and the, the fortitude to get through it, and uh, that things go smoothly for them. And Father, we think of, uh, again, of so many... Um, service members that are in harm's way and we think of our first responders as well and we hold them up to you today again give them strength and uh, i pray for so many that um just rail against them and father i just again i pray for peace in that regard and help us to be peacemakers that's what you've called us to be and uh, be your liaisons and your ambassadors and uh, help us to spread that love and uh, all that around that you want us to do in your name. And 
Father, we think of, again, of so many others that are on our list here, and I'm not going to mention them all, but you know them all. The sickness, the traveling, the, the uh, illnesses, and cancer, and, and surgeries, and all of those things that people are dealing with today, or facing soon. Just pray for each one, Father. Hold them up. Pray for the rest of our service today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand again. We're going to sing a wonderful, merciful Savior, and um, children are dismissed to Children's Church. to be with you again today 
And uh, you know, it is good. It is good for us to be together. Good for us to be together and studying God's word. We should never take this time for granted. Uh, there, are, there are others in the, in the world that don't have this opportunity, so it's good to be, get, be able to open God's word openly together. Well, this week uh, we, are, uh, find, we find ourselves right in the mo- middle of a book study, right in the middle of the, the book of Revelation, trying to, to sort of wrap our heads around what takes place during this very difficult time in human history. I mean, it's future history to us, but it's, it's a difficult time for humanity uh, as God's plan roll out. Now, I mentioned last week uh, that, that one, of my, one of my passions as a pastor is to, is to help people, help you, anybody listening, to really understand the scriptures and then to fi- find a way to apply whatever we learned to our lives. It's got to be personal. We've got to understand it. We've got to find a way to apply it to our lives. And, and of course, it's impossible to hit a home run every single uh, time, especially when those listening are in different places, you know, maybe in their faith walk or you know, younger Christians, some who have been in church most of their whole life. You know, it's hard to do that. Um, and uh, on top of that, you know, every one of us have different interests, right? So some things is, oh, this is just exactly what I want. And I was like, oh, well, what are we still in Revelation for? All right, so uh, we have all of that that sort of plays out. But I just want you to know, generally speaking, that is my goal. That is my goal. That's what I believe uh, makes our, our time together profitable, is making sure that we understand what's in God's Word. And it's all important. Uh, so to do that with uh, the book of Revelation, it's going to take some repetitive teaching, and it's going to take some real creativity on how, how to proceed and how to present the material, okay, because there's just a lot in here. So now if you were with us uh, last week, uh, or you were listening uh, to that message, you'll know that I asked us to consider the book of Revelation sort of like a trilogy, Okay, and um, it didn't make a difference uh, whether you thought of it, uh, thought of it about like uh, three books or three movies. That doesn't make a difference at all. But I wanted to to break the material into three major components uh, so that we could focus on each one independently, each one separately, while knowing that they are all connected to one storyline. But to think about it like three different. Um, movies, read different books, and so we understand that there's more than what we're studying that way, okay? The first installment uh, we've already done. We had to, had to do uh, with the church or the bride of Christ, and, and it covered all of chapters 1 to 3 and part of the, tr- the transitional chapters 4 and 5, which happens to be playing out in the throne room of God. We've already covered that section of scripture, which included, if you remember you were here, it had the seven churches, right, and had these seven letters to these seven churches, and, and I believe includes the rapture of the church up into the throne room of heaven. And, and what we find in, in those transitional chapters of four and five is some of the activities in heaven trigger what's happening here on earth. They play out on earth earth as part of the seven-year tribulation period, okay? A a seven-year period promised to the nation of Israel back in our Old Testament book of Daniel, as well as some other places. So the seven-year tribulation is a section of revelation that I wanted us to consider sort of like the second installment. The second book, right? We already dealt with one, and now we're going to get into the tribulation. Just so you know, there's a third. There's a third installment and, uh, in the trilogy, which, which includes some unbelievable stuff that we're going to get to. It includes the millennial kingdom. It includes the final judgment of Satan, right? He is going to be judged fully and finally in, in that 
period of time, and then it goes right on into our eternity future. As much as we can know about that, we're going to touch on some of that as well, but that's coming a little bit later on. It's an eternity future, though, that we need to understand this part for every single redeemed person from all points in history, not just us, not just the church. It's for everybody all the way back to the beginning that trusted and were redeemed from what they knew about God. And everybody that comes to know him after the church during the tribulation period that we're talking about. Everybody is going to be part of that eternity future if they've been redeemed. All right, so that's all part of our eternity future. So that third, and, and I would say that final installment brings the first that we've already dealt with, and the second installment that we're dealing with right now, and it brings them together in an unbelievable way that brings God glory. So he does amazing things in the first one. He's doing amazing things that we're dealing with here. And in the third installment, he brings it all together in a way that just brings him incredible, incredible glory. And we will get to that later on in our study. But for now, we are just, we're just getting our feet wet. I guess, in, in, in this second installment called the Tribulation. Now, last week, I gave you a, a teaser sort of concerning this section of the Revelation, and, and this week, I want to expand upon that and give you sort of a preview of, of the events associated with the Great Tribulation. A teaser, remember, I talked about it, a very short, very concise way to communicate what's coming, but a preview digs a little bit deeper by giving additional details, a lot like what I mentioned last week about someone who's reading a book, considering a book, you know, they would go and at one point they could take a look at all the chapter titles and they'd read all the chapter titles in the entire book just to sort of get a sense of what was coming, the, the mile markers of the journey that they were about to take if they decided to purchase the book and read it. All right, so let me give you, because I know not everybody was here, but let me give you uh, the teaser that I shared from last week uh, before we present uh, the preview with the rest of our message. So here's the teaser for you. Some of you have already heard this, but here it is. What we find in these chapters is, like it literally is, the most epic battle between good and evil. We're going to find that in here. God Almighty, you know, the creator of absolutely everything, he finally deals with the rebellion that has plagued humanity's existence from almost the very beginning. He deals with it all. It is here that not only is God's wrath poured out upon rebellion, but it is here that he brings his nation Israel back to himself in one of the greatest redemption stories of all time. The power, the fury, and the patience and the love of our God are all on display throughout the Great Tribulation. So that was the teaser. That was the teaser that we sort of, and that's all true. That is all in there, what we're going to be dealing with. So that's, that's where we are, and that's what we're about to step into. That and so much more is found within these chapters. Now the, the title of today's message is right up on our screen here. It is a time of judgment and drawing. It's not just judgment. It's, it's both here. Okay, so hopefully you can hear both sides of the coin when we talk about judgment, but we also talk about this drawing. God has, and God is so good, right? But he has absolutely uh, no difficulty doing more than one thing at the same time. You know, we, sometimes we struggle to do multiple things. He has no problem doing multiple things at the same time. Now, last week I mentioned that the book of Revelation it is chronological in nature, and that is certainly true uh, during the tribulation regarding the judgments that are metered out. It is chronological as we, as we work our way through, and, the, and these judgments are happening. But sprinkled throughout the time of God's judgments, and, and as they're being delivered, there are, there are key moments that we're going to bump into. There are key moments Call them whatever you want. I, I put a couple names here too. You may have something better. If you do, let me know. I, I had uh, topical interruptions uh, and uh, to the 
to the general chronological flow. So it is moving chronologically, but several times we have these interruptions in the middle there, and, and there's something topical that he deals with. Uh, you could also call them interludes. Some people have done that. Some, as an interlude takes place, if you want to think about it that way. But at key moments uh, in the flow of the judgments, we will have these topical interruptions that are, listen, they are, they are very significant, uh, but they are, they're not necessarily chronological, okay? Uh, but before we even get into the chronological flow, and we will, uh, and the timing of the judgments, I want us to identify where these topical interruptions are. There's four of them, there's just four, but I want us to know that they're there. So when we bump into them, we know something has changed, all right? Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, list uh, the chapters or, or the chapters and verses of each one just briefly and mention uh, what kind of what we find there, just the key thing that we find there, okay? Long story short though, it's within some of these topical interruptions that we really see the hand of God in a loving way, drawing people back to himself. Because you have judgment, 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 but then you see his love. We see his drawing in some of these, so it's that important, okay? And just so you know, he is drawing more than just Israelites to himself. He is drawing people from every tribe and nation to himself for salvation during the tribulation. In fact, I just... I'll be honest with you, I, but what I see here playing out, I believe it will be during these seven years of tribulation that we will see the greatest number of converts from the world to the family of God. I think we're going to see the greatest number of that uh, people that happening during this very difficult time. I believe it will be greater than the time in history of salvation, even than when Jesus was here. I think it will be greater than, than the birth of the church. And, and Pentecost. I think we're going to see some greater things happening during that time than even we saw in our history when God moved mightily. So God is, uh, is going to be working out two essential things at the same time. He's going to be judging uh, the rebelliousness of the world and at the same time drawing humanity back to himself for salvation. And through it all, the nation of Israel is going to come back to him, okay, which he's promised. They will, and his promises never fail. So we're going to see that take place. So these topical interruptions, okay, I'm just going to tell you them first, and I'm going to show you a slide after to, to help you out. Okay, the first interruption happens, Revelation chapter 7, the whole chapter. The entirety of chapter 7 focuses in on how God seals for himself 144,000 Israelites and he gives a, a list of each of the tribes that he dry, drops uh, 12,000 from, okay? So 12,000 people from 12 tribes of Israel, there we have 144,000 sealed witnesses for God. That's in chapter 7. And, and this is one of the places that really supports the idea that the church is not the focus, but we are we're back on track with the nation of Israel. So let me read to you just one verse from Revelation 7, that we have uh, just before this detailed list of, of each tribe. You know, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, it'll come up on your screen, it says this, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then the next verses give family after family after family, where we have 12,000 from, from each one, Okay. So we will be studying portions of this chapter next week. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deeply today because we're going to get there next week, okay? But just so you know, this 144,000 uh, will be the primary missionary force to evangelize the entire planet during these difficult years. And they, they will be protected by God uh, because he seals them. He protects them. Okay, so that's going to happen, but this is, the, this is the primary force that gets it done, all right? So that, that's what's happening there. And um, the next interlude, so that's the first one, chapter 7. The next interlude in the chronological flow during tribulation happens, Revelation chapter 10. So we jump into your chapters, chapter 10, uh, verses 11 to 13. Uh, this is uh, actually chapter 10, 
to 11.13, so I almost two chapters here. Uh, and what we find this time is an angel was sent by God to deliver a message to the Apostle John by, you may have heard this before, making him eat this little book, right? That was sweet, but then it was just horrible to him. And, and so that's what he does. But basically what he is doing there, he's making the announcement of, of the judgment that's coming. And, and, it's, and it's difficult. So there's a, all that is happening there. But we also find in that break, something that may interest a lot of you, it is these two witnesses that are a topic of so much debate concerning who are they. Who are the two witnesses that are coming during the tribulation? Lots and lots of people speculating. And, and uh, what we find this time is that, is, is that this angel is uh, delivering a message to the Apostle John, and it's all about that judgment. And then we have these two. And if you don't know this part of the story, uh, there are two witnesses that prophesy against what is happening on the planet. Now, people are living this out, okay? And it's difficult what we're going to be reading about the judgment part. They're living it out. And, and we're going to have two prophets letting them know what's going on and that they should turn, they should come back, and they should trust uh, the God who created them, right? And, and they are absolutely hated uh, by the worldly population. They are hated, hated, hated. That's an understatement. Okay, and, and they are given power to do miracles and to kill anyone who, who tries to harm them. Many people um, believe they know their identities. I'll give you some examples. Some think, well, it's got to be Elijah and Moses. Absolutely has to be, represents the Old Testament. It's got to be those two. Others believe, no, 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 Zerubbabel, maybe Joshua or a couple of good option. Still others think it's got to be Enoch, Melchizedek. You know, there's some, some of those didn't even die. So how, everyone's got to die, so it's got to be one of them to come back. And there are other several reasonable guesses. But listen, we will not know until they arrive. That's the end of it. It doesn't say. We don't know. We will know when they get here. Uh, and by the way, it may be some two totally different people. That don't relate to anybody. If, if anything is possible on the table, but they're coming. And there will be two. God's word says that they're coming. So they will be here. All right, so those are two of the interruptions. I'm just trying to give us a, a place where we know when we bump into it, oh, yeah, you talked about that. Okay, there's two more. There's two more as we come. And uh, the third covers Revelation chapters 12 and 13, where we are introduced to the Trinity. But it's the unholy trinity. It's not our trinity. It's not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It's not that at all. It is the unholy trinity. You may never have heard of that. But listen, Satan, Satan wants to not only copy God, but he wants to usurp God's authority. And guess what he does? He sets himself up as the Father in this unholy trinity. And he sets the Antichrist up as the Son. And guess what? There's an anti-spirit. We're going to bump into that as well as we go through uh, some, of, uh, some of Revelation. And the final interruption in the chronological flow of judgments is found in Revelation chapters 17 and 18, where we learn about the great mystery of Babylon and how God ultimately destroys Babylon and exalts himself over her. Okay, and that's another topic of debate. What is Babylon? Lots of people have, have struggled with that. What does it include? Is there a religious component? Is there an economic component? What is it? Right, so we'll talk about that when we get there. But that is chapter 17 and 18. Okay, now I just, maybe you don't take notes that, like that, but let, it's going to, a slide's coming up. Let's, take, let's bring that slide up that shows the four interruptions. So, some people like to take pictures of that, whatever it is, but the, here they are, okay? When we start working our way through, we're going to bump into these chapters and just know when we do, the chronological part of Revelation takes a break for a few minutes, and we talk topically, but we'll get back to the chronological part of the judgments coming out. Chapter 7, chapters 10 and 11, a part of 11, all of chapters 12 to 14, and chapters 17 to 18, and there they are, and there's the major topics. There's more in each one, these are like the most important things to just sort of remember. 144,000, 
those two amazing witnesses. We're going to talk about the unholy trinity. We're going to talk about what is the mystery of Babylon, all within our study of the tribulation period. Like I said, there's more after. There's a third installment, right? That's more after. We're just talking about the second installment that's happening here. So those are the interruptions to the chronological timeline. Now we will try to identify how God's judgments are metered out during this tribulation. That's the other side of the coin, right? Because this stuff's happening during the tribulation, but there's another thing that's happening, and it's going to be real judgments happening on the real planet Earth, and people who are living here are going to be facing it. Okay, so I believe we'll be in heaven during this time, seeing it from there. Other good pastors have different opinions on that. We've talked about that. I think we'll be there watching. I think the evidence shows that. But either way, these things are going to be happening on the planet during the tribulation period. So those are the interruptions. Um, but let's get to these judgments. Now let's just start. <laughs> There's a lot here. Okay. But let's just start with this. Most Bible teachers agree that there are three sets of judgments that play out during the tribulation period. Most would be in that camp. There's three sets of judgments that play out. And I'm going to give you some names of them just so you know because we're going to bump into them. Uh, the sealed judgments. We've already talked about them a little bit. The sealed judgments where we have the scroll in heaven being opened, right? And, and Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one, the only one worthy to open the seals, right? We have the sealed judgments uh, playing out. The second group, trumpets, trumpet judgments. And the third group, the bowl judgments. And in some versions may call them vile judgments, okay? Uh, not vile like bad, but vile like a little vile to hold something. But the bowls or the vile judgments. So seals, trumpets, bowls. So agreement on the, the fact that there are three major sets of judgments that we find in the tribulation is just about where the agreement ends. I just want you to know that. Uh, a lot of people agree on that. There's a lot of differences after that. And uh, so... And it seems as though everybody has their own idea of when these judgments happen, how they play out on earth. So let's, let's just start with the basic idea that the scripture says there's three. There's three sets. Each set of three, each set has seven within them, seven parts to each of these sets. So there are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, okay? <laughs> seven, seven, seven. Uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that's agreed upon as well. And almost all Bible scholars that believe the Bible would say that God will use these three sets of judgments to pour out his righteous wrath upon the wickedness of the world. Every sin must be paid. Everything gets dealt with. And God deals with it in a righteous way. And he deals with it through these three judgments, okay? So there are a couple of anomalies, which I want to mention, we're not going to get into them right now, like the seven signs that show up, and then there's these seven thunders that the Apostle Paul or John wants to write down. They said, no, no, you can't write that down right now. Uh, seal that up till later. So there's something happening there that's still hidden to us that we have no idea what it is called the seven thunders. They'll figure it out when it happens because they were told to, to not write it down, okay? Um, but besides those two, most scholars will agree about the three sets of judgments and that the seven parts are being poured out in, in each one of them during our tribulation. So now the timing of these judgments are another matter completely. And I'm going to present to you why I believe that these three sets of judgments play out concurrently, not sequentially. Okay, so I'm going to tell you why I think they run out concurrently, not sequentially. And, and, I'm, and I'm simply going to identify uh, the three major points that support the timing that I believe is true. And, and as I do, I'm going to bring up a slide to show you uh, visually uh, the representation of what I believe we see playing out in the scriptures. Okay, now in future studies, just so you know, we're going to go over some of this stuff and and in future studies, we are going to go much deeper into each set of judgments. So if you're saying, like, why didn't you talk about that one? I've always wanted to know. We're, we're going to come back to it, okay? So we're going to do that. 
So let's bring up the first slide that shows the seven seal judgments. Okay? There are the, the seven seals. There's the places that you'd find them in the scriptures there. Uh, we, we, we mentioned these as part of both of the last two messages. We've touched on the seal judgments. There they are. And, and I, I have the seal judgments broken up into two sections there, such as uh, seals one through six, and then seven all by itself. There's a reason for that. There's actually a couple of reasons for that. The reason that they are, are broken up is because when we read through the book of Revelation, and you can see by where they are, that between seal number six and between seal number seven, we have that first interlude about the 144,000. It finds itself right there between the two seals. So that's one of the reasons why I broke it up. But that's not the only reason. That's not the only reason they're broken up, uh, but that is one of them. So the last time, we did a quick uh, overview of the seven seal judgments, but I would like to take a look at seal number seven so that we can identify something peculiar about that that happens as part of the final judgment in this first series called the seals the seal judgments okay so turn with me if you would it's going to come up on your screen as well revelation chapter 8 and we're going to look at verses 1 to 6 okay remember this is the seventh one out of a series of seven here we are at the end of the seals okay and this is what it says because this is Jesus opening the seal in heaven, right? Remember, saying things are happening in heaven that play out here on earth. So this seventh seal is being opened up by the, the lamb who was worthy to undo the scroll. So here we are. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets then another angel so not one of those who have the trumpets but then another angel having a golden censer came stood at the altar and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne remember we're in heaven and the throne room of God itself so that's where we're playing this out when I believe the church is right there watching this go down and he does that with the censer, okay, and the prayers of the saints. He offers it up, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. That's not where it ends. It continues, and it says, Then the angel took the censer, he filled it with fire from the altar, and he threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Okay. So he throws them down. So the judgment is part of the throwing things down. And the trumpets are ready to go as he throws them down. Okay, so, so we have two very important things that we find as part of this seventh seal judgment that I believe helps us uh, with the timing of the next set of judgments, which is called the trumpet judgments. Okay, so there's a couple things here that I really believe will, will help us out. So the first thing that uh, we should notice is that part of the seventh seal judgment identifies that there are seven angels who stand before God and they were given the seven trumpets in verse 6, and they were prepared to sound those, those trumpets. And that's part of the seventh seal. Okay, then they talked about they are there. Okay, so that's the first interesting thing that hasn't happened in any other places. Right? That's the first interesting thing. But the second, in my opinion, and even more importantly, is the descriptions that we are told happens when that single angel throws the fire from the censer down to the earth. Look at verse 5 again. It says, the angel took the censer, filled with fire from the altar, he threw it to the earth, and then look, listen to these descriptions. There were noises, there were thunderings, there were lightnings, and there was an earthquake. Okay, so that's what happened 
there at the end of that one. Now, so as part of the seventh seal, we read that there was silence in heaven for half an hour, which is important because there's some worship going on. There's awe and worship happening there. But there were also these noises, thunderings, lightnings, earthquakes, and we're going to run into those phrases again. Pick up on those. When you see stuff like that, lock it away and say, when you, especially when you see it more than one place, that's intentional, all right, in Scripture. Okay, because the, the seven angels with the seven trumpets being part of the seventh seal, uh, that, that helps us uh, to figure out or where these noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes that I'm, I'm going to make a statement about, uh, I believe, because we're going to find them again, actually a couple places we're going to find them again, I'm going to make this statement to you. I believe that all of the seven trumpets, that all of the seven trumpet judgments are included in the seventh seal judgment. That's how I see the scriptures playing out. Okay, so, so within the seventh seal judgment is all seven of the seven trumpet judgments. So let me bring up the slide with adding something to it. So visually, kind of get an idea uh, of what I'm talking about here. So here we have these first six seals, this major interlude that talks about the 144,000. And then we get to the final seal. And I think within that seal we have another whole set of judgments as part of that judgment. Okay, something being added there. Okay, so notice that just, just like how I divided up uh, the seal judgments, we are going to also divide up the trumpet judgments into two categories, exactly the same, six and one, sixth and the seventh all by itself. And we're going to do that for the very same reason that we divided up the seal judgments, exactly the same. Because so right between the trumpet judgment number six and the trumpet judgment number seven, guess what we run into? This other topical interlude there that speaks about the two witnesses. So the first break's talking about the 144,000 evangelists. And then we get to the second series, right at the same point, we have this other to two, the two, um, the two prophets are playing out there, okay? And just like last time, let's read about the seventh trumpet judgment. So now we're moving to the end of the second series, the seventh trumpet judgment, and let's see what we find there. So jump ahead with me, Revelation chapter 11, and this time we're going to read verses 15 to 19. Okay, and this is what plays out, what happens when that seventh trumpet is, is done. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Look at the worship. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones, they fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were, look at this, lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. Okay, so this is uh, the same list that we see associated with the seventh seal, except for one addition, that is great hail. And, and I would make the claim that the noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes are speaking about the same thing that would mean both of these judgments would at least end at the same time. And, and if the trumpet judgments began as part of the seventh seal judgment, and they end as part of the seventh seal judgment, then all of them must be included within the seventh seal judgment in that period of time when that is being poured out. Okay, so 
If, if that was true, it would also support the idea that we find other places in Scripture that when judgment comes, it will come quickly, but it won't just be coming quickly. It will increase in intensity, and it will speed up. It will increase in its frequency. That's the idea of the word when it says it's coming quickly. So it's, it's two sides of that same coin. So that would sort of play into the very same thing we would find. Intensity would r ramp up, but also the speed of the judgments being metered out would happen, happen quicker. Now, there are other clues as well, like, like how as part of the sixth seal, the heavens were rolled back and the people were asking for the rocks to fall on them. We'll get to that and hide them from the face of the God who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb that it would lead us to believe that it wasn't just nuclear war, okay? Like some people would say, I could see the heavens rolling back. But I think it's more than that. It would lead us to believe that they probably could see right into heaven as part of the seventh, uh, the, the other one, and as part of the seventh trumpet judgment. And it, here it speaks about further looking into the temple of God being opened in heaven. And I'm wondering if back in the other one that they were seeing the heavens opened up too. They knew these judgments weren't just happening from nation against nation. These judgments were actually happening from God Almighty uh, because the heavens themselves were rolled back. There's one final series of judgments that are called the bold judgments, or like I mentioned, the vile judgments. That's what you might have in your scriptures. Let's see what we read concerning the seventh one of those, right? We looked at the end of the first series, the end of the second series. Let's see what we see at the end of the bold judgments. And for that, turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 17 to 21. All right, and again, it'll come up here. So we've moved ahead through six others. We get to this last bowl, and this is what it says. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings, and lightning, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the city uh, and the nations fell, and great Babylon, which we will already, we'll talk about later, great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail, just like the last time, great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the, the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And some have identified the weight of the hail as unbelievable. It would destroy everything. We'll get to that too as we take a look. But yet again, we have the very same list of noises, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake, and hail. So there is, is more uh, than, than what I just showed you. And we're just quickly going through this, right? There's more than what I just showed you to, to, to support what I believe the claim that is true uh, to make that uh, we will get to some of them as we study through the series of the judgments. But for the sake of, of this time, I'm going to bring up the final slide that I believe shows all of the bowl judgments being part of the seven trumpets. It's like we're zooming in, right? And we're, or, or it's coming out, at, well, however you want to talk about that. And um, listen, and again, I, I want to keep saying, you're going to hear me say this a lot, okay? Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are lots of good interpretations on the timing of these judgments and how they work out. This is how I believe the scriptures describe the progression in not only intensity, but also in the speed at which they arrive here on the planet. Okay, now imagine if I'm right, I think I am, but imagine for a moment that the seven seal judgments uh, carried us uh, from, let's just say, nearly the beginning of the tribulation all the way to the end. And, and even if they weren't uniform in their timing, right? <coughs> the, even if that wasn't the truth, there would still clearly be time, we're talking about seven years here, right? There would clearly be time between each judgment hitting uh, those who lived here on the earth. There'd be time, there'd be breaks, right? As 
as one hit, kind of recover a little bit, catch your breath, and then another one would hit in over a seven year period, right? So that would be happening. Uh, and uh, now imagine that as part of the last judgment, there were seven judgments unleashed during that very same period of time. Imagine that, imagine playing that out. And, and, and as bad as it had been uh, uh, up uh, under the judgments that far, uh, up until that point, whatever this time is laying out, it's, it's seven times worse, okay? It's coming faster and more furious during this last time. And now on top of that, when you get to the seventh trumpet judgment, which has just been meted out much faster than the seals, when you get there, we have another speed up of seven times for the bulls judgments, because they're all incorporated in the, the, that final trumpet judgment. So the, listen, at that point in human history, the judgments would be coming so fast and, and so furious, it'd be so severe, that it would seem like there was actually no chance to catch your breath. It was just unrelenting, coming harder, harder, faster. There'd be no place to run, no place to go. And, and imagine being, because people are going to survive up until this point. Nations are going to survive up until this point. So many are going to uh, perish. But there's going to be people here experiencing all of this. And, and out of sheer desperation for the unrighteous people who will not relent. Okay, so th think of that group out of sheer desperation for it to come to an end. All of the nations of the world that have survived these judgments will gather themselves to a place called Armageddon to do battle with their creator just to make it stop. That's where they're going to be at on the planet. It has to stop. This is not sustainable. We will go, we will fight to try to make it come to an end. Newsflash, you know, the scriptures say, it doesn't work out so well for them. Okay, but that's where they're at. They go because they have to go. It is that bad. That's a topic for another message. We will get there. Now, I realize that's a lot of information uh, to put out there in one message, especially if you have not a lot of familiarity with the, the book of Revelation. And if that happens to be you, man, hang on. Hang on with me, okay? Uh, we're going to slow things down. We're going to slow things down and study specific parts of the tribulation period. All I wanted to do with this message was to lay some groundwork, create a blueprint, uh, however you want to think of it, so we can just start beginning to work with it. It's so much information, people shy away from it. Right? I wanted to sort of lay something down for us to say, oh yeah, you talked about that, and now I have a place to put that in, in my mind's eye when we're getting there, okay? So that's all I wanted to do, was to do that, to lay that groundwork. So even if you feel like many of the details that uh, maybe went over your head, uh, in future messages, we'll talk about them, and, and this message will hopefully, at that point, become very, very helpful uh, to you. Now, one of the great... <coughs> One of the great takeaways, and this is more than just this, but one of the great takeaways uh, from the tribulation is that God is always drawing people to himself, even in the hard times of life. That, that's a takeaway we can get from this. Even in the worst time in human history, God still has a plan to draw people to himself, even rebellious people he wants to turn to come to him. So let's not forget that God, God gives a blessing also to, right at the beginning of this, he knew this was hard stuff. He gave a blessing at the beginning for those who would share it and those who would hear it, and those who would read it, right? And so yeah, that blessing is supposed to be an encourager to help us to keep engaged with what we find with that. So again, I just ask that you would uh, pray for your, your pastor. You know, I, I try, to, try to present things in a way that can kind of make sense, difficult things in a way that can be clearly understood, but I also want to find a way for you to be able to put it into your life because we all have hard stuff going on, right? And, and God still wants to draw you. God still wants to draw the people in your family that may not know him as Savior. Just don't think because it's so bad that the, the well hope. He's a powerful God, and he wants, if anybody will come of their own free will, he wants them to come to him. So there's a couple of things, but please pray for me as we try to pull all this together and to present it in a way that's understood and helpful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you. 
Thank you for your, your revelation, the revelation actually of Jesus Christ, uh, the one who is worthy, the one who will make everything right, the one who will, who will put down all rebellion, the one who will reclaim the rights to not only Israel but to the whole earth and then will present it back to you, Father, and in a glorious moment when he puts everything back fully redeemed to you at your feet. And Lord, what a privilege it's going to be uh, to be part of that moment. And uh, we're part of history, part of your, your plan working out. Help us to recognize where we are, not get so caught up in the things that are going to happen in the future that we are no earthly good today where you have us. We are in the church age. We are part of your bride. We are part of the first installment that should help us to motivate us to tell people how good it is to know you as Savior so they won't have to face the things we're talking about during the tribulation period, Lord. Give us wisdom, discernment, help us to present things in a way that's pleasing, not off-putting, but give us the power to be bold in the right way. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. If you would all stand, we're gonna finish with the same power. that you empower us to do your work. We're thankful that we can gather here, be confronted with your word, the truth of your word. But Lord, may we go out and represent you well with boldness. And Lord, may you bless the efforts that we put forward. In Jesus' name, amen.